In today's lesson, we will discuss the atom and the history of the discovery of the atom. When you think about the atom, a model such as the model we see here may come to mind. You have what's called the nucleus, and we see the nucleus here. The nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons. Protons are represented here in red and they carry a positive charge. Neutrons are represented here in blue, these blue spheres. And neutrons, as the name suggests, do not carry any charge. So in the center of the atom, you have the nucleus, which is a small, dense core. And it carries the mass of the atom. Now, if we look out from the nucleus, we see here represented again in, as blue spheres, the electrons. And electrons are negatively charged particles. And they're shown here, we can see what are called the orbits of the electrons. So each of these um, circles represents the path that each of the electrons take as they orbit around the center dense core of the nucleus. And if you notice then between the nucleus and between the orbiting electrons, there is a lot of empty space as we can see here. And this model, or this way to think about the atom, is known as the planetary model. The idea being that it represents a solar system. And in a solar system, you have the sun at the center, and you have the planets orbiting the sun. And in a similar way with the nucleus, and it's why we call it the planetary model, the nucleus represents the sun, and the electrons represent the planets orbiting the sun. It's not a completely accurate picture of the um, structure of the atom, but it's one that many may visualize when they think of the atom. And this is what's known as the atomic structure. So it's the structure of the atom. And the atom can be thought of as a small particle, and it's like the fundamental unit of all of material, everything that we see around us. Everything we see around us is made up of atoms and a combination of atoms. And they are extremely small. And they are mainly made up of empty space as far as we know. So an interesting thought experiment. It is calculated that if you take the average person and you take all the atoms that make up that average person, and you are somehow able to remove all of the empty space in all the atoms that make up the person. What remains of that person could easily fit inside the volume of a grain of salt. So you can see here we have salt, and in a tiny grain of salt, you could fit all of the protons, all of the neutrons, and all of the electrons that make up an individual person into that space a person could easily be reduced down to the size of a salt grain. Now, if you were to take all the people on the planet and you were to do this exactly the same thing to all the people on the planet, so you take out all the space from all the atoms of all the people on the planet, and what's left, all of the protons, neutrons, and electrons that make up all the people on the planet could easily fit inside the volume of an apple. So it gives you the idea of how small these subatomic particles are, and also as well that when you look at the fundamental unit of the material that surrounds us, it's mainly made up of empty space. 
We know a lot today about the structure of the atom because of the hard work and dedication of a number of philosophers and scientists who are hard at work thinking about and carrying out experiments um, to figure out what is the fundamental, what is the structure of the fundamental unit of, of everything that we see around us. It started in 500 BC with the Greeks and the majority of the subatomic particles that we see here in this uh, presentation today was discovered between the 18 and 1900s. And it was painstaking work carried out by dedicated scientists over a period of time. It was built up through patience and painstaking experimentation and the collection of data and thinking of that data and proposing models backed by evidence to support the structure that we see here today. The ability of scientists to observe the materials around us has become very sophisticated over time. The idea that all of the material around us is made up of small particles called atoms could only be terrorized by um, Greek philosophers back in 500 BC. So they could take an onion and cut it in half and the image that we see here would be available for the Greek philosophers. This is what we can see under uh, the naked eye. We can see the structure of the uh, onion, but we're very limited in relation to what we can actually see and what we can study. But the Greek philosophers could imagine and look at this and think, okay, if I was to continue cutting this onion up and I was to cut it up into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces, when I get to the smallest possible piece, what would I have? And they imagined a small particle. Now, with the invention of the light microscope, this enabled humans to look deeper into the structure of the materials that surround us. So if we look at this image here, so this is an image of onion cells, the fundamental building blocks that make up an onion. And we can see here because of the use of the electron because of the use of the light microscope, we can see much more detail in relation to the structure of the onion. This is what we can see under the naked eye. And if we look under the light microscope, this is what we can see. And we start to be able to make out some of the structure of the onion cells. So we can see here we can see clear boundaries, and these are known as the cell walls. We can see here in the middle, we have the nucleus, and we have what are called chromosomes, which are parts of the onion cell that carry all the genetic information that give all of the characteristics to the onion cells. And we can see, we can see these here in both of these images. Then inside you, we have a substance known as cytoplasm, which is what all of the parts inside of the cell float around in. And images like this were unavailable to Greek philosophers back in 500 BC. But with the invention of the light microscope, a whole new world uh, opened up to humans. We started to be able to peer into the microscopic world. But again, even at this, uh, hot, even at this detail and even at this magnification, we are still nowhere near the size and scale of the atom. Now, if we look in here inside uh, this onion cell and we take one of these guys here and we were somehow able to zoom down into this piece here, these are what are known as chromosomes. Now, as time passed, microscopes became much more sophisticated and with the invention of the tunneling electron microscope, which is a much more sophisticated uh, microscope and it can look at and it can image very, very small um, parts of the cell, for example. And if we look here, what we're looking at is a chromosome of an onion cell. And we can see this is the, here are the chromosomes here, looking at it under the microscope, and here is the same image of the chromosome, but it, we're looking at it using what's called a tunneling electron microscope. And we can see all of a sudden, 
that much more information and much more detail in relation to the structure of uh, the chromosome and the structure of the onion cell and therefore the structure of the onion is much more becomes available. And we can see here there's incredible detail, but still even down at this very, very high magnification, we are still nowhere near the size of an atom. If we look at this image down here, what we're actually looking at is a piece of platinum. And platinum is a material that is on the periodic table. Now, if we look at, if we see each of these individual, uh, almost individual circles that are present here, you can see them dotted all, the whole way through uh, this uh, piece of platinum. What we're actually looking here at are platinum atoms. So today, platinum atoms, like we can see in this image, can be directly observed. And it gives further support to uh, the idea that everything we see around us is made up of these really, really small particles, which we call atoms. Now, it wasn't always the case that we could directly observe um, platinum atoms like we can and like what we can see here in this image. And over a period of time, as, as I mentioned, scientists started to build up a clearer and clearer and more detailed picture of the atom. And that started off with a number of experimentations that started in the 1800s and ended in the 1900s. And we're going to take a look and ha take a look at some of the scientists that were involved in the discovery of the parts that make up the atom. And the parts being the uh, protons, the neutrons, and the electrons. So back in Greek times, philosophers such as Leucippus and Democritus proposed the idea that all materials, that all of the materials that made up the world around us could be broken down into simpler or smaller particles. And they kind of envisioned, envisioned particles, something like this, like small, round, almost billiard ball type particles. And they envisaged that these particles could not be broken down into any simpler form. So the idea of the atom started as far back as 500 BC. But they had no way at testing their ideas. They had no way at building up knowledge or building up um, evidence to support the idea that they had. And the word atom comes from the Greek idea of indivisible or something that cannot be broken down further. And everything is made of these particles, which is collectively known as matter. And the idea of um, thinking about everything in the material world as being made up the, of these small spherical uh, particles of matter, this, this idea is what's known as the particulate nature of matter. So the idea of the um, atom started to take hold as far back as 500 BC. So the idea is that we have these really small particles called matter, and this is what's known as the particulate nature of matter. Now also as well, matter is something that occupies space and it has mass. So everything that's made up of matter occupies space. It has space and nothing else can occupy that space that it takes up. Also then as well it has mass. So if you hold a very heavy weight in your hand what you're actually feeling is um, the mass of that object. So you have gravity, the earth, that's pulling down on that weight and that's, that's, that's what you're feeling, okay, that the effect of gravity on the mass of the object. So this is where it really started, the idea of viewing all of the material in the world as made up of these small particles. Now, there have been many observations since 500 BC, um, closer now to the 1800s, that have supported the idea that everything around us is made up of these very, very small particles. And one of the observations is the movement of very small invisible gas particles uh, in the air. And this process is known as diffusion. And we can look at such an observation here. So what we have here is we have a glass tube 
And inside the glass tube, we have cotton wool. On the left-hand side, cotton wool that's soaked in a substance called ammonia. It's a gas. And then we have on the far side then here, we have a cotton wool soaked in a substance called hydrochloric acid. Okay, and this here, this is the, the chemical structure, if you like, of ammonia. So it's made up of nitrogen and three hydrogen atoms bonded together, and it makes up a particle of hydrogen. And then on the right-hand side here, we have hydrochloric acid, which is made up of a hydrogen atom and a chlorine atom combined together to make up uh, hydrochloric acid particles. And if we look here, this is a way to kind of visualize the particle. Okay, so we can see here that the ammonia particle, the NH3, is much smaller than the hydrochloric acid particle. And if we look here at the mass of an ammonia particle, we can see that it's roughly 17, 17 atomic mass units. And we can see here that the hydrochloric acid is, is 36 atomic mass units. So the hydrochloric acid here, as we can see, is a much bigger particle. But nonetheless, both of these gases are made up of very, very small particles. Now what happens is if you set our experiment up like so, and we have we have both of these uh, soaked cotton wool buds uh, enclosed in um, a glass tube like such, okay, and it's stoppered on both ends. If you leave this for a period of time, what will happen is you will get a white ring will form here, roughly in this position down the glass tube. And what this white ring is, it's um, ammonia chloride and Basically what's happening is the particles of ammonia, which are coming from here and they're moving in this direction, meet up with the particles of the hydrochloric acid, which are coming from, from here and move in this direction. And when the particles collide and meet here in the middle, you have a chemical reaction and you get this white ring formed. Now to explain this experiment and this observation, we have to think about very, very small particles of ammonia, moving through the air in this direction and very, very small particles of hydrochloric acid moving in this direction and those particles then meeting up here in the middle. Now the movement of these very small particles through the air is known as diffusion. So particles of gas, they diffuse through the air. Now also as well, what's interesting to note is the position of the ring. The position of the ring on down the tubing, okay? It doesn't happen in the middle. It happens more to, the, more closer to the right-hand side, closer to the hydrochloric acid uh, cotton, cotton wool soaked bud. And the reason being is because if we take the ammonia, okay, we can see here, so the ammonia particle is much smaller. And as a result of that, it can move through the, uh, the glass tubing much quicker. Okay, it can pass in this direction much, much quicker. Okay, if we take the hydrochloric acid particles, they're bigger and they're heavier and they take longer to diffuse through the air. And as a result of that, the lighter um, ammonia particles, they travel faster down the tubing. And as a result, we get the uh, chemical reaction happening here in this location. And again, this is just one observation that I started to really support the idea that um, we have these very small particles that make up everything around us and that those particles can diffuse through the air. So if we try and think about this then just purely from a model point of view, so we can model everything uh, as these really small particles, and this is the particulate nature of matter. So what we have here on the left-hand side, so we have a concentration of a particular gas, which is represented by these pink um, particles all close together. And what's going to happen is, through the natural process of diffusion, these gas particles are going to start to move out and spread out um, in all directions. Okay, And after diffusion, you'll see here, you'll see that the gas particles are spread out and they're more uniformly spread out uh, within the medium, okay, or within the air. And we can also see as well that the air that the particles are spreading out into, they
and this is what is known as the particulate nature of matter, okay, and the diffusion of gas. Uh, and again, this is an idea um, or an observation that supports the idea that everything around us is made up of these really, really small particles. Now, diffusion also occurs in a liquid, and this can be observed when dye is dropped into a beaker of water. So we can see here that the um, particles that make up the dye when they're dropped into the water, they start to diffuse through the liquid until they are spread out uniformly within the liquid. Okay, so you can see here, so the dye is very concentrated in one area, and what happens is the, the small particles that make up the dye, they start to move out and spread through the liquid. And you get this spreading or diffusion effect, and as a result of that, these small particles, they mix and spread out within the liquid. So even though we cannot see down and see the individual particles, but what we can see here, we can actually see the collective effect of many, many of these particles together. And again, these were observations that scientists were making and they were starting to give credence to the idea that, um, you know, if, if we look at the materials that make up the world around us, they're made of these really small particles. And again, what we can see here, we can just look at this and we can model it from a particle point of view. So we see here that we have the dye and it's made up of these really small particles. The dye is put into the water, which is itself is made up of very small particles as well. And over time, these small particles, they start to move out and diffuse and spread out through the liquid. Okay, and again, this is what's known as the particulate nature of matter. And it's a way to think about and view um, the nature of the world around us. Another very interesting observation which supports the idea of the particulate nature of matter is what's called Brownian motion. And we will have a look and see what this is. It's, it's very well explained uh, in this very, very short uh, clip. Brownian motion. Here you can see tiny plastic beads in water, seen through a microscope. The beads are only a thousandth of a millimetre across. In 1827, scientist Robert Brown was studying pollen grains in water. He noticed that the grains of pollen were constantly moving. They jittered and moved about randomly. He suggested that the pollen grains were moving because they were alive. He repeated the experiment with soot grains which he knew were not alive, but he saw that they moved in the same way. He could not explain what he had seen. These are soot particles floating in air. In 1905, Albert Einstein proved that the movement was caused by tiny, invisible, fast-moving particles hitting the pollen grains. Brownian motion. Here you can see tiny plastic beads in water seen through a microscope. The beads are only a thousandth of a millimetre across. In 1827, scientist Robert Brown was studying pollen grains in water. He noticed that the grains of pollen were constantly moving. They jittered and moved about randomly. He suggested that the pollen grains were moving because they were alive. He repeated the experiment with soot grains which he knew were not alive, but he saw that they moved in the same way. He could not explain what he had seen. These are soot particles floating in air. In 1905, Albert Einstein proved that the movement was caused by tiny, invisible, fast-moving particles hitting the pollen grains.
So what we've seen there was Bromley in motion. And again, it's another observation that supports the idea of the particulate nature of everything around us. An English chemist by the name of D John Dalton suggested an atomic theory based on experimental evidence back in 1808. And this is um, a portrait of John Dalton. And his atomic theory, what he suggested was that atoms are very small indivisible particles. The atoms of a given element are identical to each other and have the same mass and chemical properties. So as an example, I've taken two elements off the periodic table. So we have nitrogen and we have oxygen. Now, if you take a sample of nitrogen, for example, it's going to be made up of uh, millions upon millions of individual atoms of nitrogen. And what John Dalton is saying here is that the atoms that make up the individual sample or, or element of nitrogen, that they will be identical to each other, that they, each of the individual atoms will have the same mass and they will have exactly the same chemical properties as well. And likewise the same if you're to take a sample of oxygen, um, it'll be made up of millions and millions of individual atoms of oxygen. All those atoms of oxygen would be identical to each other. All those atoms of oxygen would have the same mass and all those atoms of oxygen that make up the sample would have the same chemical properties as well. Now it's not exactly correct, but this was the idea, the beginning, if you like, of this uh, atomic theory that was proposed by John Dalton. Also what he said as well is that atoms of different elements, they vary in their mass. So what he meant by that was if you were to take a nitrogen atom, which is roughly uh, 14 atomic mass units, and if you were to take an oxygen atom, which is roughly 16 atomic mass units, that the, the mass of oxygen and the mass of nitrogen, they will vary. And the same as well, that all of the atoms and all of the elements that are on the periodic table, the atoms will vary in mass from each other. Another idea as well is that um, a compound contains atoms of two or more elements combined together in fixed proportions. So if we take the compound, for example, salt, which is made up of a sodium atom. Sorry now, so it's made up of a sodium atom, Na, and a chlorine atom, Cl. Okay, we can see here that a compound contains atoms of two or more elements combined together in fixed proportions, okay? So you have one, so you have um, one sodium atom combined to one chlorine atom. And that's what he meant, that's what he meant by that. Then he had this idea as well, the um, law of conservation of mass. And this states that mass, the conservation of mass states that matter is neither created nor destroyed in the course of a chemical reaction. So if we take the reaction of, of um, hydrogen, so H2 and oxygen, O2, this will pr it'll be, it'll produce a very um, strong chemical reaction and what you will get, you will get water, H2O, and energy, okay? And we'll just, like this, we'll get, you get a lot of energy being generated. So what he's saying in this uh, chemical reaction is that matter is not created or destroyed uh, in the course of a chemical reaction. So you have these individual particles of hydrogen and individual particles of oxygen, and they react together and they're not destroyed, but they are joined together, if you like, and they produce water, H2O. Okay, so if we look here, um, so we can see here that we have we have four atoms. We have four atoms of hydrogen. Okay, and if we look here, we have 
two atoms of oxygen. So therefore, on the right-hand side, we should have four atoms of hydrogen, which we do, and we should have two atoms of oxygen. And that's what, that's what Dalton meant by the law of the conservation of mass, that if we start off with a, a number of atoms, that after the chemical reaction, we should end up with the same number of atoms that we started off with. Now, a lot of uh, John Dalton's theory was proven to be not as accurate based on experimental evidence, okay? But it was a start, and um, it was a start on the discovery and further refining of the idea of the atom. And like all scientific ideas as well, they evolve based on current observation and experimentation. And this really is the cornerstone of science and it sets it apart from other contemplative practices. So William Crookes, who we see here, was um, an English physicist and he was obsessed with cathode rays, which are rays that are produced by an apparatus known as a discharge tube, which we're looking at here. So what have we got in a discharge tube? We have the um, power supply. Okay, so this is a very high voltage power supply. Now it is connected up to a cathode, which is the negatively charged terminal. And it's the other side then, the positive side is connected up to the anode, which is the, positively the positive terminal. And these two, the cathode and the anode, are set up inside a glass chamber like such. And inside this glass chamber, it's pretty much, it's nearly a vacuum. So it's very, very low pressure. And you'll notice here that in the middle here, we have a cross, which is known as a Maltese cross. Now, what happens when you switch this power supply on? What is observed is the glass starts to fluoresce like so, like we can see here in this image. And this is caused by radiation that comes from the cathode and it travels towards the anode. And William Crookes, he named this radiation cathode rays. And what he noticed was that these cathode rays, when they struck glass, they caused it to fluoresce. And we can see this green fluores fluorescence that's happening here. Also as well, what he noticed was that the um, particles were stopped by a metallic cross or Maltese cross. And he was able to observe that because you get this shadow effect that's formed at the end of the uh, tube. Now we know in modern times, we know exactly what's happening here. So you have this positively charged anode and it's very, very positively charged. And what's happening is it is actually pulling electrons out of the atoms that make up the cat the cathode, okay? So this anode, which is very positively charged, it's pulling the electrons out of this cathode. And the electrons then are moving through the air towards the positive charge. And what happens is some of these, they pass, they, they, they move in straight lines and they pass the cross and they strike the glass at the back here. Other electrons are taken up or they, they hit the anode and they, they don't travel any further. Now, William didn't just stop there. He continued then and he added to this experiment to try and find out what he could about these cathode rays. So he set up apparatus as shown here. So we can see we kind of have the same setup. We have our cathode here and we have our anode. Now the difference, and again, we have, they're set up inside a tube that's almost under vacuum, very, very low pressure. And he set up a rail. And on that rail, he mounted a paddle wheel that was free to move. Now, when the power then was switched on, the ca cathode rays were being generated. They traveled in straight lines. And what happened was they started to strike this paddle wheel. And as a result, the paddle wheel started to rotate and it started to move down the rail towards the anode. So what this demonstrated to William was that the cathode rays, so this radiation that, that he had observed, that it had enough or it had sufficient energy to move a paddle wheel. Okay, so there, 
the cathode rays were able to strike the paddle wheel and it had sufficient energy to be able to move the paddle wheel. So after all his work uh, with cathode rays, William Crookes deduced the following. So he said that, or he found out that cathode rays travel in straight lines. And he was able to tell that because of um, the very sharp shadow that was cast by uh, the Maltese cross. Um, cathode rays cause glass to fluoresce when they strike it, which we can see here, that it fluoresces a green color. And cathode rays possess enough energy to move a paddle wheel, which we can see here in this um, demonstration here. Okay, the cathode rays are generated, they hit the paddle wheel, and they cause it to rotate and move down this rail. So following on from Crookes' experiments on cathode rays, a guy by the name of J.J. Thompson, who's seen here, discovered that the rays that uh, William had been studying, that they contained negatively charged particles, uh, which we know today as the electron. So he extended on the previous experiments and he set up an apparatus as shown here. So what have we got? So we have, again, so we have the cathode, which is the negatively charged terminal. We have the anode, which is the positively charged terminal. And when this is switched on, you get cathode rays being generated as such. Okay. And again, we have this uh, glass tube and the glass tube is, is under very, very low uh, pressure, almost a vacuum. Now you'll notice here in the anode that there's a hole drilled in the material that makes up the anode. And the effect that this had was that you get the cathode rays being generated and then you get a concentrated stream or a cathode ray being passed down through the tube. Now at the end of the tube then he had a fluorescent screen. So as the cathode rays struck the screen, they caused it to fluoresce. So you get like a little spot of, of fluorescence that would have been generated there. Now, um, <clears throat> halfway up the glass tube, he had two parallel plates, which allowed him to generate an electric field. So we can see here the two plates. So we have a positive plate and we have a negative plate and they're in parallel with each other. And as a result of that, the cathode rays, as they pass down through this tube, as they're generated here and they pass down through the tube, they have to pass between these two plates. So when you switch these two plates on, you get an electric field being generated here. And the cathode rays have to pass through this electric field on their journey down through the glass tube. Now, what he noticed was that when the electric field was turned off, so when these two plates were switched off, the cathode rays passed between the plates and they struck the screen, causing it to fluoresce or light here. Okay, so you got there was no deflection. The cathode rays traveled in a straight line and they struck the screen here. And this is when the two plates were switched off. Now, when he turned on the electric field and he switched on these two plates, what he noticed was that the cathode rays were being deflected and they were being deflected up in this direction here. And they were striking the screen at this location. Now you can see here that the cathode rays are being attracted up towards the positive plate. So he was able to figure out from this observation that whatever the particles, the small particles that make up the cathode rays are negatively charged. And he, know, he knew they were negatively charged because they were being attracted towards the positively charged plate and they're being bent up in this direction. So um, Thomson then, he was credited with the discovery of the electron. So we have these cathode rays and he has found out now that the cathode rays are made of small particles that are negatively charged. Now, he didn't just stop there with his study. He went further and he used a magnet to create a magnetic field along with the electric field in the apparatus. And this is like a representation of the setup here. So you have the same thing. You have the cathode, the anode. The anode has a hole in it, which allows the cathode rays to pass through. You have your parallel plates, so the positive here, the negative here. And then in addition to that, then he set up a magnet around the outside of this glass chamber, which we can see here. So again, when everything is switched off and we just have the um, power supply switched on here that's generating the cathode rays, 
the rays pass straight through and they strike the screen here at B. Again, when you turn the, just the electric field on, the uh, cathode rays, because they're small negatively charged particles, are attracted up here towards the positive plate and you get, um, they strike the screen here at A. Now, what do you notice that when you just have the magnet switched on and you switch off this electric plate, it, the magnetic field um, deflects the cathode rays as well and the cathode rays would strike down here at point C. So what he was able to do was, he first of all switched on the uh, electric field and this caused the, uh, the cathode rays to strike at point B. And then he turned on the magnetic field and he slowly adjusted it until he was able to bring the beam of cathode rays from point A down to this position in point B. Now by doing that, he was able to work out what's called the charge to mass ratio. And it's just represented here. So it's E, which represents charge over M, which represents mass. And he worked out the charge to mass ratio as 1.76 multiplied by 10 to the power 11 coulombs per kg. So this is the charge to mass ratio of these negatively charged particles, which were called the electron. Now from this study, he wasn't able to find out the charge on the electron or the mass on the electron. He just worked out the charge to mass ratio. Also as well, Thompson concluded that the particles were to be found in all matter. And the reason he said that was because it didn't matter what the cathode, he could make use different materials to make the cathode. And he still got these cathode rays being generated. And as we know, you know, all of matter and all of the materials around us are made up of atoms. They all contain electrons. And as a result of that, the materials uh, can lose electrons or electrons can be pulled out of them. And he also found as well that the particles were these ele electrons or these negatively charged particles, that they were about 2000 times lighter than hydrogen atoms. Now at the time, hydrogen atoms were thought to be the smallest particles that, that were, were there. But Thomson was able to show here that there was an even smaller particle, which was the electron. So after all the experimentation and observations on cathode rays, a clearer understanding was achieved. And also one of the subatomic particles, the electron was discovered. And again, this brought humans one step closer to having a clearer understanding of the nature of matter. So after all the experimentation, what had they discovered about cathode rays? They discovered that they were streams of negatively charged particles. Uh, they called them electrons, that they travel in straight lines from the cathode to the anode, and they are deflected by <clears throat> an electric field and a magnetic field. And they have sufficient energy to move a small object such as a paddle wheel. So Robert Millikan, um, an American physicist, and we can see him here, devised an experiment to try and work out, to work out the charge on the electron. So these negatively charged particles had been discovered and the charge to mass ratio of them was discovered. But now scientists wanted to put their minds to trying to figure out what exactly the charge on the electron was and what exactly the mass of the electron was. So an outline of the experiment to determine the charge on the electron and the mass on the electron is shown here. So if we take this apparatus here and we look at each part, so we have here what's called an atomizer. Inside this atomizer, we have oil, an oil sample. Now, when you spray this, it sprays a fine mist of oil droplets. And we can see here, so this is the apparatus. So it has an upper chamber. Now, when the oil droplets are sprayed into this chamber, you have a fine mist of oil droplets and if you have these tiny microscopic oil droplets. And what's gonna to happen to them is they're neutral, there's no charge on them, and they are going to be pulled down towards the earth by gravity. And they're gonna to start to move down in this direction through the apparatus. Now you can see here that there's a, a second chamber in this apparatus and there's kind of a lot going on here. So what you have is you have a positive and a negative plate and this generates an electric field inside in this position in the apparatus. You can see that there's a small hole 
in the positive plate at the top. And the reason there's a small hole there is it allows the mist of oil droplets to pass down and pass into this section of the apparatus. We can see here that there's a microscope. So this was used by Millikan to view the mist of oil droplets as they came into this section of the apparatus. Because they're very small, a microscope was needed to be able to see them. Now inside here then as well, he had this X-ray source. And this X-rays are ionizing radiation. So what that means is that they're going to ionize the air inside in this chamber. And that will mean that there'll be a lot of electrons, free electrons moving around in this part of the chamber. So this X-ray source, it ionizes the air, generates a lot of electrons. And what happens is the oil droplets fall down here. They fall into this section where um, the air is ionized and there's a lot of electrons moving around. The neutral oil droplets then, they get coated in electrons. So the oil droplets pick up electrons as they pass down through here. Now, once they pick up electrons, um, you're gonna have two forces acting on the oil droplets. You're gonna have the electrostatic force here, which is going to be, it's going to pull the negatively coated oil droplets up here towards the, the positively charged plate. And then at the same time, you're gonna have the force of gravity acting on the oil droplet, pulling it down towards the earth. So what Millikan was able to do then is he was able to adjust the charge on this plate until he was able to get the oil droplet to literally suspend in midair in this section of the apparatus. So the force pulling the electrons down or pulling the oil coated, the, the oil droplet coated in electrons down towards the earth, which is gravity, was equal to the force that was pulling the electrons up towards the positive plate. And from this then, when he achieved this, so he's able to look in and use his microscope and see an oil droplet just suspended in midair. He was then able to use a mathematics. He was able to work out the charge on the electron. And he worked out the charge as 1.6 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 19 coulombs. Now the charge to mass ratio had been worked out and this is it here. So what, uh, Robert Millikan was able to do, he was able to take this figure and he was able to substitute it into this formula. And you can see here then he was just able to use um, basic mathematics and he was able then to work out the mass of the electron. And the mass of the electron was worked out to be 9.1 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 13 kg, which is an extremely small number. So Robert Millikan using this um, experiment, he worked out the charge on the electron, and he worked out the mass on the electron. So scientists then started to think about possible models for the atom. So Thomson proposed the idea that the atom had a sphere of positive charge, like this here. Okay, so you have this, you have a sphere that is positively charged. And then electrons are embedded in the sphere at random intervals like this. So this was the way that uh, Thomson envisaged or modeled the, um, the structure of the atom. And this became known as Thomson's plum pudding model of the atom. So, okay, so they had discovered the electron and now they're trying to figure out like what is the structure of the atom. And it's called a plum pudding because it resembles a plum pudding. Now, it wasn't quite right, but again, it was a start. And like scientific ideas, they have a starting point and the ideas evolve as more and more evidence becomes available. So another scientist and his team, so a scientist by the name of Ernest Rutherford and his team, uh, Zeiger and Marden, devised a groundbreaking experiment where through painstaking work and practice, they've discovered a clearer model of the atom. So this here shows the setup of the experiment. So Rutherford and his team, they used radium, which is a radioactive substance. And radium, it spits out particles, which were called alpha particles. And alpha particles are positively charged and they they basically consist of a group of two neutrons and two protons stuck together. So what they are really is they're the nucleus of a helium atom. 
Now, they're very, very penetrating, which is why a lead block is used to encase the source of radium. And the idea is that they wanted the alpha particles to be directed in one direction at a particular object. And that's why the lead block was used like so. And again, they're highly penetrating, so alpha particles will pass through most material, hence why you have this really uh, big, thick piece of lead used to encase it. So if the way to think about radium is it fires out alpha particles, much like a machine gun, and it has like an unlimited supply of ammunition, okay? Now, in this experiment, the target for um, the alpha particles was a piece of gold that was hammered into a tin gold foil, like so. Now, around the apparatus then, you had this fluorescent screen which was used to detect the alpha particles. And it was made up of zinc sulfide and it was used then to detect the alpha particles. So as the alpha particles pass through the air, they pass through the gold foil. They come and they strike this um, fluorescent screen and you get a little flash that happens. And this experiment was carried out in the dark. Now, when they set up this experiment, it was expected that most of the alpha particles would just pass straight through the gold foil and some of them would be deflected at small angles if the thompson plud pomadine model was correct. Now, what actually occurred was very exciting and Rutherford described what happened as follows. So he said that it was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15 inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. So what, wa what was the observation that he made that, that made him come out with this famous statement of his? Well, what he found was that it was expected that all of the alpha particles would just pass like this, pass straight through and strike the uh, fluorescent screen. Some of the alpha particles would be deflected at maybe slight angles. But what he found was that some of the alpha particles were being deflected at very large angles, like here and like here. And some of them were even being deflected at even larger angles like this, which they're almost being reflected back on themselves. And then yet even more of them were being deflected literally right back along their own path. So that's why he, he mentioned that it was like firing a 15 inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and the shell bouncing back at the person, okay? So this was completely unexpected um, and it, it caused great excitement for Ernest Rutherford and his team. So what they had essentially discovered here was the nucleus of the atom. So if we have a look here, so what we're looking at here, so this is our gold foil, okay? And these are the atoms of the gold foil. Now, if the plum pudding model of the atom was correct, we'd have this set up here and we would get these observations. Most of the alpha particles would just pass straight through and you would get some, there would be like a slight deflection as such, okay? But what was actually observed was more like this here. So some of the alpha particles, what was actually observed was some of, most of the alpha particles passed straight through uh, undeflected. Some of the alpha particles were deflected at very large angles. Some of them were deflected at these slight angles. And then even some of the alpha particles then as well were deflected back along their own path. So if we look here, so these are the observations and what, what, what did Rutherford and his team conclude based on these observations? So where most of the particles passed straight through the gold foil, they concluded that most of the atom is made up of empty space. So just like here, so we can see that most of the atom is just empty space and it allows the alpha particles to pass straight through. Some of the alpha particles are deflected at large angles. So in the case where you get these deflections happening, uh, like here, for example, where it's deflected at large angles, this is the alpha particles are repelled when they pass near the small positive nucleus. So again, he deducted that there was a that the nucleus must be positively charged because it was deflecting the positively charged alpha particles. And in the case where a small number of alpha particles were deflected along their own paths, so like here, what was happening was that the alpha particles were scoring the direct hit 
with this dense core, this dense positive core in the gold atoms nuclei. And the conclusions that were reached then was that a small number of the alpha particles collided head on with this nucleus. And that's, that's, that's what happened. So what then did these observations tell us about the nucleus? Well, that it was small and that in comparison to the overall size of the atom, it was very, very small. Um, it was a small, dense, positive core. And it was worked out that it was over one over 100,000 the size of an atom. So extremely, extremely small. Again, a lot of the atom is just empty space. So it was a small, dense core that contained positive charge. But following on then from the success of the gold foil experiment, Rutherford and his team wondered what would happen if lighter elements were bombarded with alpha particles. So he found that when oxygen or nitrogen were bombarded with the alpha particles, like here, small positively charged particles were given off. So he set up his apparatus as such, and what happened was he took alpha particles and he bombarded lighter elements such as oxygen and nitrogen with the with the alpha particles and what he noticed was that he was getting this positive um, radiation coming off um, the bombarded elements and the the positive elements that were the positive particles that were coming off um, these elements were known as protons so what he figured was that the alpha particles were smashing up the nuclei of the lighter atoms, such as oxygen or nitrogen, to release these positively charged particles. Now, with the heavier elements, such as gold, that he initially used, because gold, if we look here, if we look at the, the mass of a gold atom, we can see that it's quite large, so it means that they have quite a big um, nucleus. And what was happening was the alpha particles were not able to get close to the nucleus of the uh, gold atom. And as a result of that, they're being deflected before they could smash it up. But if you look here at nitrogen and if you look at oxygen in comparison, so you can see here and here in comparison to this figure here. So the nitrogen and the oxygen nuclei are, the atoms nuclei are much, much smaller. And as a result of that, the alpha particles were able to break up the nucleus of nitrogen and the nucleus of oxygen and release these positively charged protons. So based on all the work that was carried out by Rutherford and his team, uh, his work can be summarized as follows. He discovered that the atom consists of a small dense positive core called the nucleus. He discovered that positive particles called protons were located inside in the nucleus. And then he proposed that the, he proposed the new structure of the atom proposed by Rutherford was that it consisted of a nucleus and that the electrons were in some sort of electronic cloud surrounding the nucleus like so. So you have your electron cloud where electrons are located and then you have this small dense core which is called the nucleus and it contains protons and the majority of the, of the um, the structure of the atom is just empty space. So a gentleman then by the name of Niels Bohr, now he was carrying out work on hydrogen atoms and he proposed a model to describe the arrangement of the electrons in the atom. Now if we take hydrogen, hydrogen generally it contains one proton in its nucleus and it has one electron. Now he proposed that the electron which was part of hydrogen orbited the nucleus of the atom and like a planet orbits the sun. So if we take, so this is our nucleus and we have our one electron in the hydrogen atom and he proposed that it just orbited around like this in a fixed location around the nucleus. And if you look here, this is a more generalized version of his model. So you have this dense nucleus that's contained here and then outside of this then you have these energy levels or orbits and they go out in concentric circles from the nucleus and he proposed that this is where the electrons so the electrons basically you have your dense core of the nucleus and outside here you have electrons that just orbit around like so in in fixed locations outside of the um outside the nucleus now he carried out a lot of experimentation as well, which I'm not going to go into in this um, lesson, but 
his idea worked very well for the arrangement of the hydrogen atom because hydrogen only had a single electron. But his idea did not work so well for other atoms that had more than one electron outside of the nucleus. But it's kind of just to give a general idea of, of this planetary model and where it came from of the atom. So we have discussed the uh, discovery of the proton and the electron. So let's complete the picture and look at how the neutron was discovered. So a man by the name of James Chadwick, who's, who can be seen here, carried out an experiment as shown here, which resulted in the discovery of the neutron. So again, we have alpha particles were used. And this time, um, a sample of beryllium was bombarded with the alpha particles. Now, what, when he done this, he noted that there was a radiation that was given off of particles that were being knocked out of the beryllium, but these particles contained no charge and were therefore difficult to detect. He found, however, that these neutral particles, that they had enough energy to knock protons out of a paraffin wax. So he put paraffin wax in front of the radiation that was given off by the beryllium. The experiment was set up as shown. So the experiment was set up as shown and it enabled J uh, James Chadwick to study these neutral particles more closely. So because they, 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 the radiation that was given off by the beryllium, it knocked the protons out of the paraffin wax. It was easier to detect and measure the protons. So this enabled him to be able to study uh, these neutral particles that were being knocked out of the beryllium. So through his study he found that these neutral particles, he found these neutral particles which he named neutrons. And he found as well that the neutrons had exactly the same mass as protons. Well, not exactly, but very, very close. The knowledge gained by uh, Chadwick by his experiments later enabled scientists to use neutrons to split uranium. So here we have uranium to, as, it, as it's represented on the periodic table. So we can see that uranium has a very, very big nucleus. So neutrons were used to split uranium atoms and the splitting of uranium atoms releases vast amounts of energy as we can see here. So this splitting of the uranium atoms was used in atomic bombs or atomic weapons that were used during World War, for example, to level two uh, Japanese cities, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And also as well, the uh, nuclear energy is used in nuclear reactors, which, are, it, which is a, a way at providing um, energy. So the culmination of all the hard work and experimentation of these scientists over the years resulted in a clear understanding of the fundamental unit of all of the material we see around us today. And so it consists of a small dense core, as we can see here, which contains positive protons and neutral neutrons. And then outside we have uh, what are called electrons, which are shown here, and they are negatively charged. So the information that was found, it can be condensed down into a table as shown here, which shows the relative values for these subatomic particles. So we have your proton, this is the symbol, this is the charge, and this is the mass that was worked out. And the mass then in atomic mass units is, is this, and its location is in the nucleus. The same with the neutron, this is the symbol, it doesn't have a charge, this is its mass, this is its atomic mass unit, and its location is in the nucleus. And likewise with the electron, this is the symbol, this is the charge that's used, the mass of the electron, uh, the atomic mass unit, which you can see it's, it's very, very small, and its location, it's outside of the nucleus. So this is the atom, and this is how scientists went about figuring out the structure of the atom. And this um, discovery is still ongoing today as well. So the subatomic particle information of any particular element is shown on the periodic table of elements. So take the example of gold here. This is how it appears on the periodic table. And it gives us a lot of information about um, the subatomic particles that are present in a gold atom. So if we take this number up here, so 79, 
This number is called the atomic number and it gives us three pieces of information about an atom of gold. So the atomic number, it gives three pieces of information about the element or the atom. So it gives the number of protons in the nucleus of the atom, which in the case of an atom of gold, it's 79. It gives the number of electrons in, in a gold atom, which in this case is 79 as well. And it gives the position of the element in the mon modern periodic table. So you can see that it's the 79th element. Now, if we take this number down here, the bigger number, which is known as the mass of the a mass of the um, elemental gold. We can see that the mass number, and this is like the mass then of an individual atom of gold. The mass of an individual atom of gold and all other atoms is made up of the number of protons and the number of neutrons. So the protons and the neutrons that are present in the atom's nucleus, that's what gives it its mass. So the mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Now we can work out the number of neutrons that are present in any atom by taking, so if the mass is made up of the protons plus the neutrons, then if we want to figure out the number of neutrons, we take this number here, which is the mass, and we subtract the atomic number, and that will give us then the number of neutrons that are present in the particular atom, which in this case is gold. Now something to notice as well, that the mass number is not a whole number. And this is because elements can have what are called isotopes. So if you look on the periodic table, a lot of the uh, mass numbers are not whole numbers. And this is because of what are called isotopes, which we'll look at now. So what are isotopes? So isotopes are atoms with the same number of protons, but different numbers of neutrons. So if we take here, so this is carbon. And this is how it shows up in the periodic table. Now, beside here, what we have, we have three atoms of carbon. Now, we can see that each of the atoms of carbon contains six protons. And we can see here, this is represented by the atomic number. So atoms that have six protons are carbon atoms. Now, we can also see as well that they have six electrons. So we have six protons and we have six electrons. Now, atoms are neutral. And the reason they're neutral is because the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons. So if you have six protons, which each carry a positive charge, you have six positive charges. The electrons carry a negative charge. If you have six of them, you have six negative charges. So if you have six positive charges and you have six negative charges, then the overall, you will not have any charge. It'll be neutral, so they'll cancel each other out. And that's the case with atoms, they're, they're neutral. Now, if you look here, what you'll notice here represented, so this carbon atom has eight neutrons. This carbon atom has seven neutrons and this carbon atom has six neutrons. So there, is, there are differences between these three atoms of carbon in that they have a different number of neutrons. Now, if they have a different number of neutrons, the mass of each of these carbon atoms is going to be different. So how do we get the mass? Remember, it's the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So in this, for this atom, we have six protons and eight neutrons. So therefore, we have a mass of 14. And this carbon atom is known as a carbon-14 atom. If we look here, we have six protons and seven neutrons. So if we add the two of these up, the mass is going to be 13. And this is what's known as carbon 13. And here we have six protons and six neutrons. Again, if we add these up, we're going to have a mass of 12. And this is what's known as carbon 12. And these three individual atoms of carbon are what are known as isotopes of carbon. So just to reflect, they have the same number of protons but they have different numbers of neutrons, as we can see here, six, seven, and eight. Now, carbon-14 is very unstable, and as a result of that, it breaks down. Now, it breaks down in a predictable way that can be measured, and this is, this is what forms the basis of carbon-14 dating. Likewise, if we look here, we have hydrogen. So this is what hydrogen looks like on the periodic table. Its atomic number is one. That means that it has one proton in its nucleus. 
So you can see here that each of these hydrogen atoms have one proton in the nucleus. How do they vary from each other? So hydrogen one, which is here, which has a mass of one, has just one proton, it doesn't have any neutrons. So it's the only atom that has only one proton with no neutrons in the nucleus. If we look at this one here, this atom of hydrogen, it has one hydrogen, it has one proton and it has one neutron and it has one electron. So again, this is an atom of carb of hydrogen. And then if we look at this one here, we have one proton and two neutrons. And again, we have the one electron. So we can see here that each of the isotopes of hydrogen, they has the same number of protons, but it has a different number of neutrons. This one has none, this one has one, and this one has two. Now also then, if you were to go out into nature and you were to take a sample of carbon, that sample of carbon will contain a mixture of the different isotopes of carbon. And likewise, hydrogen as well. It'll have a mixture of the number of hydrogen, of the different types of hydrogen atoms or hydrogen isotopes. So they will have each of these particular isotopes of carbon will have a percentage abundance in the sample of carbon that you take in, if you, if you take a sample in nature. You will have a certain percentage of carbon 14, a certain percentage of carbon 13, and a certain percentage of carbon 12. Likewise, if you're to take um, a sample of hydrogen in nature, it'll have a certain number, it'll have a certain um, percentage of each of the individual isotopes of hydrogen. Now, in relation to the mass number, why is the mass number not a whole number as it appears on the periodic table? So the mass number, it is made up, it is a percentage abundance and average mass of all the isotopes um, together which accounts for the mass number. And you can see for carbon, um, you can see why it's not a whole number, okay? Because it has many different isotopes. And when you add them up, when you get the percentage abundance and add up the percentage, the mass of the percentage abundances, what you end up with, you will end up with a number, which, which you can see here is 12.011. And this is the same for the other elements as well. Now, another idea or something I've mentioned is relative atomic mass. So because atoms are very small, the relative atomic mass is used. Now, the mass of an atom is relative to the mass of one twelfth the mass of an atom of carbon 12, which is one. So if you get one twelfth of 12, that is equal to one. This is, this is why there are no units for relative atomic mass. If we take hydrogen, for example, its relative atomic mass is one, which means that it is one times bigger than one twelfth the mass of a carbon-12 atom. And that is relative atomic mass. So the man that discovered the presence of isotopes was Francis Aston, and he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1922 for detecting the existence of isotopes using the first mass spectrometer. And this is an instrument for detecting isotopes. Now, if we take the mass spectrometer, so it's process, it takes a sample and it puts the sample through uh, these steps here. So it vaporizes the sample, it ionizes it, it accelerates it, and then it separates it and then the, separate, the separated atoms are detected. Now, the principle of the operation of a mass spectrometer, it's based on positively charged ions are separated on the basis of their relative masses when moving in a magnetic field. So this is a, a schematic of the apparatus of a mass spectrometer. So if we take boron, for example, and we take a sample of boron, now, what we do is we inject the sample into the sample inlet here in the mass spectrometer. The sample, when it goes into this inlet, what happens to it, it's heated up and it's turned into a vapor. It's vaporized. And this is the first step in the mass spectrometer process, vaporization. So you get this sample of boron. It's made up of loads of atoms of boron. 
it's uh, injected into the mass spectrometer and it's vaporized and turned into a gas that contains all the different um, isotopes of boron. Now that vaporized uh, sample then moves into the next chamber, okay, which is called the ionization chamber. So in the ionization chamber, the neutral atoms are turned into ions. And how are they turned into ions? They are bombarded with high energy, fast moving electrons that are produced by what's called an electric, sorry, an electron gun, as we can see here. So what happens is it generates um, a stream of high energy, fast moving electrons that bombard the vaporized sample. And when the electrons hit the neutral atoms, they essentially strip off the electrons. And as a result of that, they generate positively charged ions. So we can see this here with neon, for example. If we were to inject a sample of neon in there, it would be bombarded with high energy electrons. And as a result of that, some of the electrons that make up the neon atoms would be stripped off. And once the atoms are stripped off, you would have an imbalance between the number of protons and the number of electrons. And as a result of that, you would have more protons and you would end up with positively charged atoms. So your positively charged or your ionized atoms then move on to the next section and they move into an accelerating electric field. So you have an electric field here and what they do is they take the ionized atoms of your sample and they accelerate those ionized atoms at really, really high speeds into an analyzer unit. And this is this section here of the mass spectrometer. So what you have, you have a magnetic field here, and you also have a bend in the spectrometer as shown here. So the ions are accelerated into a magnetic field where they are separated on the basis of their mass. Ions with a larger mass are not deflected as easily around this bend in the magnetic field. And as a result, they take longer to exit the mass spectrometer and be detected here by the detector. In comparison to that, the lighter ions, they're easily deflected in the magnetic field. And as a result of that, they are able to take this bend much quicker. And as a result of that, they exit the mass spectrometer faster and they're picked up here by the detector. A good analogy is to think about driving a truck at high speeds into a bend. So it'll be much harder to get the truck to take the bend because of its large mass. Whereas a small light car, it'll be easier to, to get it to take the bend. So you'll be able to take the bend much quicker. So what, what essentially happens then with this, um, so this is, this is, so you get your acceleration and this is where the separation happens. So what happens is that the the atoms in your sample are then separated on the basis of their relative masses when moving through this magnetic field. So what it does, is it separates the atoms based on their relative masses. So the separated ions then, they strike a detector and the signal of the strike is amplified and a readout is obtained for analysis of the sample. So what happens is you get your your ions, they are separated here and they move down at different speeds and they strike the detector at different times. And as a result, what happens is you get a signal and that signal is amplified and the signal then produces a readout like this. So where you're getting your spikes, you're getting individual um, ions of a particular mass striking the detector. And then later you'll get um, different ions strike in the detector because their, their mass will be different and then so on and so forth the whole way down. Okay, so an example of a readout from a spa, spa, um, spectrometer is shown here for the element boron. So along the x-axis we have what's called the uh, relative atomic mass and along the y-axis you have uh, relative abundance. So if we take boron. So boron has different isotopes. And remember, isotopes are different from each other by the number of neutrons that are present in the nucleus. So therefore, they have different masses from each other. Their, their, their masses are different. 
So each line here on this readout, so this represents um, a particular isotope of boron. And you can see here that this particular isotope, its relative abundance is much lower than the relative abundance of this isotope here. So each line represents a particular isotope and that isotope, each of the isotopes have a different relative atomic mass because of the different number of neutrons that are present in the nucleus of each of the atoms of the isotope of boron. Okay, so, so that is our, the mass spectrometer and Francis Aston and his work on the discovery of the isotopes. So that brings us to the end of the lesson. So thank you for listening and I hope that you enjoyed the lesson. And just to summarize what we covered. So all matter consists of small particles. Uh, the spreading of particles is called diffusion. The idea of the atom originated with philosophers in ancient Greece. So John Dalton said that all matter is made up of very small particles called atoms and that all atoms are indivisible. They cannot be broken down into simpler particles. William Crookes investigated cathode rays in vacuum tubes. Uh, cathode rays are streams of negatively charged particles called electrons. They travel in straight lines from the cathode to the anode, are deflected by electric and magnetic fields, and have sufficient energy to move small objects such as a paddle wheel. J.J. Thompson showed that electrons are negatively charged, and he measured the charge to mass ratio of electrons. Robert Millikan measured the charge on the electron using his oil drop experiment. J.J. Uh, Thompson proposed a simple plum pudding model of the atom. Uh, Rutherford and his co-workers discovered the nucleus of the atom and the existence of protons in the nucleus. And James Chadwick discovered the neutron. And we also looked at Francis Aston and his uh, discovery of isotopes, and we talked about isotopes as well. Okay, thank you for listening.